Okay. Uh, picking up where we left off with population ecology, um, if you want to kind of dissect this, you can. You don't really have to. Just looking at hydrangea colors and like that range and distribution. <clears throat> um, so a couple of different factors that can influence species if we look back. Um, changes like in the environment, specifically this looks at water conditions and pressure. Um, movement in the biogeographic areas can also change what the distribution looks like. Um, introduce species into um, that new population or moving a group of species into a new area can make them change in a certain way. Um, we can talk about this more, but an invasive species, obviously, we know what this is. Um, an example is the Guam tree snake. Guam has no native snakes, um, and basically they introduced the snake and they killed a bunch of things. And so we saw that the distribution of the uh, snake vastly increased and the other organisms died. Another example is the kudzu vine. Um, this plant was introduced to the U.S. with good intentions. Um, it was trying to help control erosion because the roots grow really deep and it grows everywhere, but it's basically taken over lots of parts of the southern U.S. Actually, where I lived in Arkansas, uh, like it covers buildings, basically. Um, yep. Another example of an invasive or an introduced species, the European starling. Um, there was this <laughs> eccentric drug manufacturer who basically had these birds uh, imported from England and loose them everywhere, um, and so it was really bad, yeah, um, the birds had some bad contributions, it is the costliest and most noxious bird to our continent, um, they basically devour seed and fruit stores, um, they eat insects, um, they can gobble up to 20 pounds of potatoes in a single day. Um, invasive species, they bad. Zebra mussels, another example. Um, and we see that invasive species, when they're introduced, their range uh, vastly increases. Um, snakehead fish, another example. Um, we looked at this graph at the very first PowerPoint, so we don't need to talk about it. Um, and that is pretty much it for population ecology. A lot of those last things were uh, examples. Feel free to look at them if you feel like they might be useful for your open response. Uh, next up is going to be the next ecology set. Um, okay, um, general ecology, population ecology, community ecology. Um, Community ecology is looking at populations that are linked by interspecific interactions. So they have to interact in some way, usually because they are in the same uh, environment and it impacts their survival and reproduction. Um, when we look at a community, there's a bunch of different um, factors. A community is a group of species that live close together or a group of populations, so multiple species living in an area. Um, we usually see a dominant species that is the most abundant, um, highest biomass. Uh, usually it's actually plants. We see a keystone species, not always the most abundant, but usually in control of certain things. So um, the sea otter, if the sea otter dies, lots of things die. And then uh, richness is the number of species and abundance. And that varies uh, from community to community. Um, when we look at a community, we look at biodiversity. Normally, communities that have a higher biodiversity are more stable. They recover from stressors like fires and human impacts. They're more resistant to invasive species, um, like we saw in the earlier slides. Uh, variety of species is a good thing. Um, species diversity is going to be species richness, so the number of different species. Uh, and the relative abundance, so uh, the proportions of the different ones, right? If I have millions of one species and one of everything else, my riches is, or my diversity is still not that great, 
because um, I want a large amount of each species and I want a bunch of different species. Um, you can determine this for yourself. Um, again, more examples of species diversity. Um, hopefully we can tell the sea otter, we're starting to talk about keystone species um, and like predator prey. Um, in this example, we're looking at um, the necessary evil of like orcas, killer whales. Um, they keep the sea otter population intact. Um, and so basically every link is important in the predator-prey relationship. Um, also, this is looking at the food pyramid, right? It is going to require a ton of otters for an orca to stay alive because we know that as we move up the pyramid, what gets lost energy is heat. And so by the time it gets to the top, it's not the best source of energy anymore. Um, interestingly enough, as of late, there have been less uh, otters being consumed. Um, some fish populations have declined in recent decades. Shortage of sea lions and sea um, and seals results in... Um, in killer whales preying on smaller sea otters, the shortage of certain fish causes a decline in the seals and uh, sea lions. And so um, normally they won't eat sea otters, because, but because of all these factors, they are starting to. Um, sea otters are really important. Keystone species, um, they play a direct role in kind of sustaining the environment. Uh, a keystone species is one that has a strong effect on the community. Um, it is necessary for that community to function. The removal can decrease species richness and biodiversity. Um, so for examples, for example, sea otters eat sea urchins, which compete um, with like a bunch of different organisms. Basically, they would kill off pretty much everything else. And so the sea otters keep the sea urchins in check, and that basically allows um, for uh, everything else to stay really diverse. Um, you can interpret this if you want to. We did it in class a long time ago. Um, when we talk about how um, species relate to each other, we look at a couple different hypotheses. The individualistic hypothesis is a uh, chance group of species is linked and distributed according to tolerance ranges for abiotic factors. So basically it's saying that the only reason that species live in a certain area is because of the temperature. Um, what we know is probably more true is that um, interactive hypothesis states that not only do I end up in a certain area because of temperature or water, I also end up there because I want to directly interact with um, the other species, or I need something that is biotic from those species. Um, community compositions change all the time, which would indicate that um, that there's this like give and take in the biotic field, that it's not just the temperature that determines where I end up locating as a species. Um, some other factors that influence communities, disease obviously, um, interspecies, Interspecific interactions, competition, predation, symbiosis, all of these things influence um, how large the communities are, where they live, stuff like that. Um, examples of um, what happens when we have competition or predation, uh, defense mechanisms. We see Batesian, which is um, looking like a harmful species, aposematic, uh, bright colors to warn, Cryptic to camouflage, um, malarian, uh, um, malarian basically ties a posmatic, which is the color, and Batesian together. Um, something else to think about with populations is a niche or a niche. Um, a niche is a very specific role that the organism plays. I know for like an otter, it's very evident because that kind of holds up the whole organism, but each of these plants or animals plays a role. 
Uh, oak trees are dis in a deciduous forest. They provide oxygen. They provide a home for blue jays and squirrels. They remove water from the soil. If they left, all of those things uh, could not get done. Um, and so we did a lab. If you remember about the barnacles on the side of the rock and they moved up, it's an ecological niche or niche or niche. Um, when we talk about competition between species, it can be direct or, inter or indirect. If it is direct, um, it is called interference. They are directly fighting over resources. Um, if it's exploitative, um, it's indirect competition, uh, basically consuming another limiting resource that's not uh, a consumable thing, so space. Um, apparent is another type of competition uh, that is indirect. They both are preyed upon by the same predator. There's something called Gauss's Law of Competitive Exclusion that states that two species competing for the same resource cannot coexist if other ecological factors are constant. Basically, if we're in competition, one is going to always win. There's no such thing as two organisms competing and like continually living on forever. Um, basically, the loser either moves away or becomes extinct. We see competition in these two bacteria. Uh, solutions to competitive exclusion. Um, we see resource partitioning, basically finding slightly different ways to use the resources. We see these plants uh, became taller or shorter species um, so that basically um, they can have access to different resources, different sunlight. Uh, character displacement, basically they end up basically developing different characteristics um, so that they uh, eventually don't need the same resource. The last one, they're still using the same resource. They adapt to use the same resource. For the beaks, they are now feeding on two separate things, character displacement. Um, I believe this is the last thing. When we talk about ecological succession, um, we, uh, <clears throat> we look at what happens when um, basically there is a big change in the ecosystem, a fire, uh, something very destructive. Um, and basically looking at succession, looking at which things show up first. Um, usually we see uh, pioneer organisms showing up first, um, bacteria, lichens, algae, and then um, we see it uh, start to become what we call a climax community, so what it looks like at the end. Um, in a primary succession situation, there is nothing, literally zero things, from a volcano or a glacier, no soil. Uh, secondary is an existing community has already been there. Um, it's all been destroyed. So there is soil. And so in a secondary succession, uh, we see you know, plants and organisms growing first. In primary, we're always going to see bacteria and lichens and stuff like that first. What's up, Moose? Um, okay. Um, last thing we need to talk about is human impact on ecosystems. Obviously, we reduce di diversity. We create pollution. We disturb natural resources, uh, introduce fossil fuels, change pH of water, acid, rain, all of these things. Um, we also release so much carbon dioxide that we are retaining a lot more heat in our atmosphere. Therefore, the, we have the greenhouse effect and global warming. And that is it. Um, we will move on to the next video.